of Moses. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Cross Community Church. Uh, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the, the pastors, staff members here. And I'm just really glad to, to be here this morning. Um, we're, we're finishing up our series. It's called Jesus is Jesus. As you see the <laughs> graphic. <laughs> it's just called Jesus is. Uh, but every time I've seen I couldn't say that at the beginning of the series because then that's all you would see for the next five weeks. So uh, this is the last week, and uh, we're comparing Jesus uh, to the great men and women of the Old Testament. And ultimately, what we're trying to show is that Jesus is greater, that Jesus was mightier, that he was more powerful, that he was the, the completion of what they had tried to do. And so uh, this morning, uh, we're going to look at a, a character who is... He's a bit of an odd guy. Uh, however, he is one of my favorite characters and, and one who, when I, when I began to study his life, even years ago, this isn't my, my, first, uh, my first shot at teaching on Elijah. Uh, when I began to study his life, it spoke to me in a, in a really powerful way and really had a lot of encouragement for me where I was in my life at the time. And so this guy's name is Elijah, and he was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, and I feel confident saying that this morning. He wasn't just one of the greatest, and there were a lot of great prophets of the Old Testament. I believe that he was the greatest prophet um, of the Old Testament, and so, uh, man, Jesus is even better, though, and so we get to see that this morning, and uh, however, as great as Elijah was, um, his life, it had highs and it had lows. It had ebbs and flows. Um, he was still human, when it came down to it, and I can't help but, but feel that, even as I have studied it this week and I've looked back on my life this year, I've seen that same pattern. My life has ebbs and it has flows. It has highs and it has lows. Now, if you don't know me very well, you just need to know that most people, they kind of say that I'm kind of like this, like I'm just kind of just kind of flatlined. Um, here's me excited, all right? Here's me like on the worst day of my life, like, okay. Now, some of y'all are like, every day is, is like this, you know. Uh, that's just not how I am. Um, I may not show it outwardly, uh, but I do. I have highs and lows. I have ebbs and flows. As, and, and I guess what I mean by that this morning is that as I've desired to walk with Christ this year, as I've desired to give my life in service to him, in service to this church, I've had moments where I've done well with that, where I've walked in him faithfully. I've had moments where I haven't done well with that, where I have walked in with my own selfish desires at the forefront of my mind, uh, where I have been, uh, I've had moments where I've read his scripture daily, where I've devoted daily well. I've had moments where I've had to confess in accountability that I haven't done so well this week at walking with Christ. And it irks me. It bothers me. I wish I could be perfect. I wish I could be consistent. I wish I could be um, even as good as Elijah, who we're going to read about this morning. Uh, but I have a feeling that many of us in here this morning are walking in with that same feeling. Our life may be in shambles this morning. You may be overrun with anxiety, with fear. Uh, wondering about you know where your next meal is going to come from. Wondering how you're going to pay the bills, or your, your life may be great right now. You may be coming in here, and you may be on a high point in your life, but no matter where we are, I hope that we're blessed by the story of Elijah this morning, and that we have much to learn from him. So we're going to be in the, in the Old Testament in 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings chapter 17, and I read from the ESV. First Kings chapter 17 simply says in verse 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tisbah in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And so like we kind of begin this story and it seems like, hey, where was his intro? Where did this Elijah guy come from? And the answer is this was his intro. We don't know. Um, I, I kind of love this about Elijah. It says he's the Tishbite from Tisbah. 
In other words, he's from the middle of nowhere. When you look at the, the history of Israel, we know where Gilead is from. We know where that is. We don't know where exactly Elijah was from. It's almost like he came out of the ether. He was from the middle of nowhere. He steps onto the stage. He's already, we, we know he's going to be a prophet of God. He proclaims this very simple thing to the king of all of Israel. A guy from the middle of nowhere just says this to the king A. Ahab. He says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And then he just steps off the, off the plate. I kind of wonder, if you kind of got to understand what's going on in Israel at this time. I don't want to delve too much into it, but we covered David. He was the greatest king of the Old Testament. And, uh, he established his kingdom. He was a man after God's own heart. He followed the Lord well. However, his son didn't do so well. He started off great. His son Solomon was the wisest and richest king of all the earth. Uh, he didn't end well, however. By the time Solomon's life had ended, he had given his heart over to idolatry. He used to follow God, but now he wasn't so sure. He followed other gods, too. He made sacrifices Uh, to other gods, and as a result, the kingdom was torn away from him, and it was divided into two, Uh, the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. And so for the next hundreds of years, king after king, some did well, but in the kingdom specifically of Israel, most kings didn't do so well. This was supposed to be God's chosen people, the people that were supposed to follow him, the people who, who he had set aside for a purpose that were holy. Yet king after king disobeyed God. They transgressed his law. They set their hearts toward other gods. And this king Ahab, it keeps saying, was worse and worse and worse. This king Ahab was the worst king of Israel so far. And so Elijah comes out of the middle of nowhere, the man from the middle of nowhere, and says, there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. He was sent by God to proclaim a drought. A drought means famine. Famine means suffering. And so Elijah steps onto the scene and says this to Ahab. Now Ahab is a man who, whose allegiance is not toward God at all. I wonder, you know, as we read about Ahab, I wonder where, where his heart was. Did he think that this God to whom they still had a temple to whom there were still priests making sacrifices. Was he just this antiquated old thing that we did, that my my fathers and grandfathers of the past, that they served? Ahab did not serve the Lord. He served a God called Baal. Baal was the God of storms, of lightning. If you wanted to compare him to someone, you could compare him to, to Zeus. And so as this man comes out of the middle of nowhere, he's probably thinking, who's Elijah? Who, who, from where? This madman just yelling things at us that there may neither, neither rain nor dew, proclaiming drought. Well, I serve Baal. I serve the God of storms and of rain. Do you think this man has any control over what's going to happen in our country? We serve the God who can control the storms and the rain. So I'm thinking at this moment, Ahab's thinking, no big deal. This crazy man said some crazy things, and oh well. That wasn't what happened. Just spoiler alert. So here's what happens next. Verse 2. Elijah proclaims the drought. And then he's whisked away. It says, And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith. I just want to pause for a moment because it's just a few verses, but I would almost call this like Elijah's training moment. And we all love a good training montage, don't we? So God sets him up. He gives him this word. He proclaims the drought. But God is not through with Elijah. Prophets were sent for a purpose. They were to proclaim God's word to the people of Israel, sometimes for the good, a lot of times for correction, a lot of times not for the good. And if God wanted to use Elijah, Elijah had to be the type of man that God could use. So we all love a good 
training montage. Like think of Rocky. You know, he's waking up early in the morning. He's going on his jogs. He's passing all the butchers. He's going into the butcher's shop. He's punching the, the cow, like hanging on the meat of slab. You know, he's working hard to be the man that is ultimately going to win the fight, right? So that's what's about to happen to Elijah. He's going through his training regiment. Here's what Elijah's training regiment looked like. Let's start in verse 2 again. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And so this doesn't sound like much of training, right? Like he's from the middle of nowhere. He comes and says this incredible thing to Ahab. And then God sends him back into maybe even more of the middle of nowhere, like the middle of nowhere of the middle of nowhere in complete isolation. And it was a simple task. You will go out here. You'll drink from the brook that is here. That will be your source of water. And every day the ravens will feed you. Once in the morning and once in the evening. It's kind of a bizarre story and kind of something to, bizarre to think about. God desired to provide for Elijah only what Elijah needed each day. It's as, if, is, it's as if Elijah needed to learn in that moment that God was, A, going to take care of him. Every day, he was going to take care of him. Every day, Elijah woke up, and by faith, he had to know that the raven was going to come to bring him his food. Elijah had to know that, B, that he could not do this on his own. There was nothing, he was in the middle of nowhere. He could not provide for himself. He had to let go of his reliance on himself, and every day, turn to God and rely that he was going to provide him the food and the water that he needed. And now as bizarre as the story is, I think we all might could endure this for a couple of days, maybe even a week. But as far as we know, Elijah may have been in this wilderness for a year or longer. Every day, waking up, trust, having to trust God, learning that lesson, learning who God is, learning that God is the God who provides, learning that God was a God who was good to him, learning to trust, learning to be faithful, growing in his faith and knowing who God was. It may not sound much of a training regiment to us like we would think of today, but I think as we look through scripture, we understand and we see that God wants to take care of us, that God wants to provide for us that God wants to make us less reliant on ourselves and our own efforts and more reliant upon him and who he will be for us. We see that all throughout Old Testament. We see that in the New Testament. Yet far too often we don't learn this very simple and basic lesson. Yet Elijah in the wilderness learned to trust in God. Uh, for me, and the reason that part of this story is just so meaningful for me, is there was a, a time in my life where I felt like I was in the wilderness. Um, it's kind of funny now as I look back on it, but before I worked at Cross Community, I worked at a church called Red Oak, and to kind of just understand the story a little bit, I grew up in Van Buren, so not too far from here, and uh, Van Buren's a medium-sized town. It's bigger than Poto, but I would not call it a small, a small town. Now, if you're from like Dallas or Northwest Arkansas, you would call Van Buren a small town, but it didn't feel small to me. And I went to college at UCA. It was an even bigger town, uh, more opportunities, more people. And it was while I was um, in Van Buren as I continued in college that I felt like I was called to ministry. And so I was going to devote my life to Christ and do whatever he had called me to do. Um, I had trained. I had served in my youth ministry. I had served as an intern. I had put together sermons. I had put together events. I had failed miserably sometimes. Um, throughout college, I served in our college ministry. I led worship. I served God, and I thought that uh, because I had put in some hours that I deserved something pretty decent after college, a, a decent-sized church, a decent-sized ministry. And so I just began to pray that God would lead me uh, wherever he wanted me to go. 
And so God sent me to Red Oak, Oklahoma. Now, I don't know if y'all know where Red Oak is. You should. It's not too far from here. It's about 30 minutes west of Poto. And uh, I remember I, I was called, and they said, we would like to consider you for our, our youth pastor position. And uh, I, had, I barely knew who the pastor was. And so I drove out there, and I, I nearly drove through the town before I even realized it was there. Red Oak is, is a town of about 500 people. It's the middle of nowhere. I felt out of place there. I felt like I had gone back 50 years in church. Um, honestly, I didn't go into it with the, the kindest and the most uh, humble of heart. Yet I did feel like God had called me there. I did feel like that was where I was supposed to go. And so um, for three years, I devoted my life to that ministry. And I remember somewhere in between there, I began to wonder, God, what do you have for me? I'm in a place I don't know. Um, On Sunday morning, God, church may be interrupted because there's a cow in the road, you know. And I'm, I'm thinking, is this, is this it for me? And it was then that God began to peel away the, the spiritual pride that I had in my life. Like, who was I to think that Red Oak was not a place worthy of having Brandon Lopez as a youth pastor? Who was I to think I was better than these people? That I was deserving of anything greater? It was during this time that I began to read about Elijah to come to understand that he was a man from the middle of nowhere. And back to the middle of nowhere, God had sent him to learn. And so I began to, to understand that God had sent me to Red Oak for a purpose. To understand that a church, no matter, no matter how large or no matter how small, deserved men and women who would be leaders there and would be faithful, whether they had great or whether they had little to learn that I was no better than anyone. To begin to tear away the spiritual pride that was in my life. To begin to rethink the way that we do church and to see that there are people there that loved God. As I look back on it now, man, Red Oak was a great place. It was the middle of nowhere to me. But it was a place that God transformed me and tore away the pride that was in my heart. And I'm forever grateful for that experience. I can't help but think that Elijah had moments like this. God had called him. He stood before the king. He was a prophet called by God. And back to the wilderness he went to learn to trust in God. And man, did Elijah learn this lesson well. It continues. And we're going to have to paraphrase some of this just to do the the whole story justice. But Elijah goes from the brook, it says in verse 7, and after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And so Elijah had to continue to trust in God. So God sends Elijah to this place in the city called Zarephath. It's here that he meets a widow and her son who has very little. He arrives hungry and thirsty. Now there's a famine in the land. There's not enough to go around. And he asks this widow just for her to make him some simple food. And she says, listen, this is all I have. I have just a little flour, a little oil. We will make a meal together. We will eat it. And then we're going to die. But Elijah, learning trust in God and knowing that God was going to provide for him, does his first miracle. Elijah proclaims that the jar of flour that she has and the jar of oil that she is making this food with will not go empty and so for again for a number of for a time of a year or maybe more every day the widow her son and Elijah ate from a from a pot and a uh, from a, a clay pot that was never empty God provided for them in this really incredible miracle it goes on after a time the widow's son actually gets sick and dies Elijah cries out to God uh, through this incredible circumstance he prays over this child and demonstrates his faith by performing the first resurrection that we see in Scripture. Elijah, by his faith in God and through this miracle and through what Christ or really what God had done, brings this boy back to life. 
It's why Elijah is one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, or the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, because he did things that no one had ever done before. It goes on for a time like this because God is calling his people to him and sending famine to to shake the people awake. And that was Elijah's purpose, and his story hasn't ended yet. And so after a while, Elijah has this moment where he gets to go back and speak to Ahab, where he gets to... uh, to continue as his call as a prophet. And so in 1 Kings chapter 18, let's look at verse 17. First Kings chapter 18, verse 17. And this is probably the most powerful story from the life of Elijah. And it says that uh, when Ahab saw Elijah, so Ahab's been looking for Elijah because now it's getting really rough in the land, and I guess the whole Baal thing isn't working out. He's been searching for this man, Elijah, and so this is what it says. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, it is, you, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, And the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so Elisha says, listen, enough is enough. You send to me every prophet of Baal and every prophet of Asherah. We're going to meet together, and it's for this purpose. So Ahab, in verse 20, sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near, and all the people said, how long... And he said to them, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. So he says, this is the purpose that Elijah has called. He's called to to be the mouthpiece of God for the purpose of calling people back to faithfulness in God. He said, for these past years, you've seen Baal can do nothing. Asherah can do nothing. Listen, if the Lord is God, then follow him. You can't follow Baal, you can't follow Asherah, and you can't follow God at the same time. God is the one true living God, and Elijah knew it by this moment. He knew it deep within his soul. And I'm astounded by how the people answer him. It says, uh, I lost my verse. Okay, verse 21, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. It says, and the people did not answer him a word. They still didn't know the right answer. They were still lost, silly people wondering about what they should do with their lives. So then Elijah said to the people, I, even I, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal prophets... Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire. He is God. And finally all the people answered, and they said, It's well spoken. They didn't know the right answer, and they... and. Now, Elijah sets up this test to make a sacrifice to their God, and he's going to make a sacrifice to their God, but they're not, neither are they going to set their their sacrifice on fire. In their minds, maybe Elijah was setting up a test to prove that Baal was God. After all, he was the God of storms and the God of lightning. And so when I think, when when the scripture talks about fire falling from heaven, oftentimes it means lightning. And so in their minds, it it would be nothing for Baal to send lightning simply to this fire, to this pile of wood on the ground to create a fire. How long will they go limping? Well, they're about to find out. They're about to know who is God, and they're like, okay, this is good. And so to paraphrase just a little bit, Elijah lets the prophets of Baal and Asherah go first. They come out, they pray to Baal, they ask him to send fire, uh, it gets really rough. Baal is not answering just like he has in the past three years. Uh, they're beginning to cut themselves to provoke Baal to action. At some point, Elijah begins to 
to, to mock them, really. Elijah says, maybe Baal's on vacation. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's relieving himself on the toilet. Elijah's living it up a little because he knows the truth. There is only one true living God, and they're wasting their time. They're absolutely wasting their time. Finally, they've had enough. I guess Baal isn't answering. Now it's Elijah's turn. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 29... I just want to read this because I really can't tell the story any better. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, and there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar. I think when things get inspirational, it just kind of like tears me up a little bit. As Elijah in his faithfulness, he repairs the altar of the Lord. Oh, they have been thrown down. Verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars can, um, with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. He absolutely drenched the sacrifice. It was basically impossible for this to even burn. It says, and at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Jacob, if you were here to hear, uh, to hear Nathan last week. Let it be known that this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. And that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and looked at the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah slaughtered the other prophets. You know, it's kind of crazy. But it's this moment where they're wavering between two opinions. Who is the one true God? And they saw something that I will never see in my life. They saw the fire from heaven fall. They knew that day that the Lord was God. I wish I could say from here on out that people followed God. Um, They didn't. They continued to turn to other false idols. But God used Elijah in a powerful way that day. And people knew who the one true God was. From here, uh, this, is mo- this is perhaps Elijah's highest moment, his mountaintop experience. Uh, from here, God sends rain finally to the people. He ends the drought, he ends the famine. But what's crazy is that Elijah's about to experience perhaps his lowest low. It's kind of crazy how that happens sometimes, to go from your highest high to your lowest low. This incredible miracle happens. The people see that God is the one true God, that he is the one who can answer by fire, that Baal was nothing, that Asherah was nothing. Yet when you upset the status quo and, and do things like that, it upsets people. And so Ahab's wife Jezebel issues a death threat against Elijah for the slaughter of the prophets of Baal and Asherah. 
And Elijah becomes absolutely devastated. He goes back into the wilderness. Just for paraphrasing for Tom's sake this morning. He goes back into the wilderness and has this moment where he's praying to God and says, God, I just want to end it here. God calls him to the Mount Horeb. Through some circumstances, God speaks to Elijah and listens to Elijah's complaint. And he says, God, I have been faithful to you. I have served you. And it's I and I alone. And in this really beautiful moment, God reminds Elijah that he loves him, that he is not alone. That there were 7,000 people that yet in Israel that had not bowed the knee to Baal, that still followed God. And then God gives Elijah a helper named Elisha. As I think about the life of Elijah, if I could just characterize his life in just one word, it would just be faithful. He had highs, he had lows, he had ebbs, he had flows. He was not perfect, he was a human, just like you and I. But what made Elijah great was not the miracles that he did. It wasn't the showdown at Mount Carmel. What made Elijah great was his faithfulness. He learned that in the wilderness. And it's that that inspires me. What's it look like for us to be faithful this morning? I guess I think of Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. Paul urges the people to continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. For us to be faithful doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have ebbs and flows highs and lows. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have anxiety and stress and problems at work and financial problems, problems with our marriage and relationships. It means that through that all, we remain faithful to the Lord. We keep our hope in the gospel steadfast. We keep our faith in Jesus. To be faithful just means to continue to day after day place our faith in Christ because he is enough. And Jesus is greater than Elijah. You may be wondering, was I ever going to get to it? Well, here it is. Jesus is greater than Elijah. Jesus had his own moments where his trust in God was tested. He was sent into the wilderness just like Elijah to be tested by Satan. And Jesus overcame Satan flawlessly. He overcame his flesh flawlessly by quoting scripture right back at Satan. Jesus lived in our flesh. He knew what it was to be tempted. And he overcame the flesh. Jesus showed us what it was like to be completely faithful. Jesus never wavered in his strength of his relationship with Christ. He taught us what it truly means to devote daily, to seek God and to be obedient to him. Jesus performed miracles greater in power and greater in number than Elijah ever could. Jesus brought numerous people back from the dead. The blind could see, the lame could walk, the mute could speak. The the demons fleed before Christ and his power. And perhaps even most of all, Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He was resurrected to new life. I mean, How great is that? Like I died and he resurrected himself. Jesus was greater than Elijah. Elijah was just a prophet, a mouthpiece of God. And although Jesus was a prophet, he was more than that. He was the son of God. He came that we might have life and might have it abundantly. It is by faith in Christ that we live this morning. Not faith in Elijah, but faith in Christ. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies that the prophets would bring And finally, Jesus reminds us that we do not go on this journey alone, just like Elijah. We are the church. He established the church so that we can walk with other believers together in faith and be encouraged by each other. So that when we are going through the broken parts of life, that others around us can pick us up and urge us on in the faith. However, there might be one thing that Elijah has on Jesus. Scripture tells us that Elijah never died. And I wonder if he holds that over Jesus sometimes. 
Elijah was taken up by a whirlwind on chariots of fire into heaven. Never tasted death on this earth, uh, yet Jesus did. And I kid, but Elijah was the greatest prophet and a man whose life we can be encouraged by. Encouraged to be remaining faithful. And so I just have two really short applications for you this morning. First, remain steadfast in the faith. What is your life devoted to? If God is God, then follow him. If you are God, then follow yourself. Make a decision. What is your life devoted this morning? I pray that if you do not know God, that you would come to know the one and the true living God this morning. Know that Jesus loves you, that he died for your sin, that he wants to give you new life and give it to you abundantly, that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. For those that have been believers for a long time, I pray that you're encouraged this morning to continue to run the race that is set before us. Remain steadfast in the faith. Second, don't go it alone. Christian, the Christian life is not a life of solitude. It is not a life of isolation. Jesus created the church, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here because here we all are. But we don't go it alone. Are you part of a community group? You need to be a part of one. You need men and women around you who will encourage you in your faith, who will help you when things are tough, who will remind you of the truth whenever you're wanting to, to search after the things that your flesh wants. You need people that will call you out when you're doing that. You need people who will love you, who will spur you on in your faith. Don't go it alone. Would you guys pray with me?